Hello to our friends joining us via recording. Today we are reviewing for the lab final exam. The lab final exam is next week and it covers all of the material that we've covered since the midterm. So starting with muscle tissue all the way up through special senses. A big part of what we learned each week uh, aside from just the normal topics was we learned about the locations of muscles and we learned what those muscles did. We also learned all about bone markings. That by itself, muscle identifications, bone markings, muscle action type stuff, that's probably a third of the exam, if not more, by itself. So make sure we are using those practice assignments to review. And today's class should really help us out as we're working on muscle actions. To get us ready to talk about muscle actions, we started with a review of the joints in the body. These are the joints when we're looking at our rules for how muscles move. These are the joints that we're talking about movement around. So it's important for us to remember where they're located. And for most of these joints, their name tells us what bones they're in between. So this is a good review of bone locations as well as our joints because they're all tied together. Let's start with the one joint that kind of has nothing to do with, with uh, it, its location has really nothing to do with its name per se. We're looking at a joint here called the coxal joint. Can you help me out in the chat? What would be a normal person name for the coxal joint? What would a normal person call the coxal joint? Yeah, exactly. The, the normal person name for the coxal joint is the hip joint. So I'm gonna do some color coding here. The coxal joint, I'm gonna color code red. So the coxal joint, uh, I'm not sure if we use this terminology or not, uh, but it gets its name because the bones of the hip together are called the os coxae. So remember that the hips are made of the ilium, where you put your hands on, the ischium that you sit on, and the pubis that's in the front. Os coxae is what we're talking about, your hip bones as a whole. So the coxal joint is where our hip bones, the os coxae, articulate with this biggest bone in the body here. What's the name of this really big bone? We better know this, right? By this point in the semester, we better know this one. Yeah, exactly. This is the femur. So the femur articulates with the hip bones at the coxal joint. The femur also articulates with the kneecap. What's the technical name of the kneecap? My four-year-old knows this one when she's not angry at me. She knows this one. Yeah, <laughs> the patella. Okay, so we have a joint called the femoropatellar joint, the femoropatellar joint, where the femur and the patella are, are next to each other. The patella is actually kind of on top of the femur, if you will. This is one of many joints that we find here at the knee. Another one of the joints that we find here at the knee is the joint between the femur and this T-shaped bone right here. Who's this T-shaped bone that makes up your shin here in the front of your shin? Yeah, that's the tibia, exactly. So when we talk about the place where the tibia meets the femur, underline it right there, the place where the tibia meets the femur is called the tibiofemoral joint. The knee is made up of the femoropatellar joint, the tibiofemoral joint, and also a joint that I didn't ask you to, to label on here, but remember that this is the superior, uh, I believe it's tibiofibular joint. You might check me in your lab packet, but it, it's this one right here, superior. We also have an inferior down below. So remember your lab packet asks you to group the joints together by the knee joint, by the ankle, by the shoulder. So keep in mind as you're reviewing joint names, there's more than one joint found at some of these major locations. 
So we know this is the tibia. We've got the T-bone right here, the tibia. That brings me to the opposite end of the tibia, down here where we're interacting with the groups of bones like your heel bone, like the calcaneus or the navicular. As a group, what's the name of those bones that, that make up your heel or the back part of your foot? Yeah, those are called the tarsal bones, the tarsal bones that make up your heel. So the tibiotarsal joint is what I find down the joints in the ankle, the tibiotarsal joint down here in, in the foot, tibiotarsal. Okay, so we have hit all of our joints that we find in the leg. In a moment, as we start reviewing rules for movements, Remember that I will start talking about um, flexing the leg at the coxal joint. You should know that that means the whole leg is moving at the hip joint. Because I'll also talk about flexing the leg at the uh, tibiofemoral joint, for example. That means we're moving at the knee. So the joint name is going to be important to tell us whether we're moving the knee or whether moving the hip. Same thing is going to apply when we're talking about the arms. The arms can move at the shoulder joint, they can move at the elbow, or they can move at the wrist. Let's go through and look at our, our technical names for some of these joints over here to help us figure out if we're talking about the shoulder, the elbow, or the wrist. Let's start here. The distal radio ulnar joint. Is that at the shoulder, the elbow, or the wrist? The distal radio ulnar joint. Yeah, so the distal radio ulnar joint is one of the joints found in the wrist. The distal radio ulnar joint, notice my little purple line right here, where the radius and the ulna meet each other far away from the attachment site, that's the distal radio ulnar joint. I didn't ask you to label it, but remember for your review that there's also a proximal radio ulnar joint up here as well. So the proximal one is in the elbow, the distal one is down by the wrist. What about when I'm talking about the glenohumeral joint? The glenohumeral joint. Is that shoulder, elbow, or wrist? The glenohumeral joint. Yeah, so this one is in the shoulder. This one's up here in the shoulder. The name glenohumeral. It comes from a bone marking, here let's not do yellow, <laughs> comes from a bone marking called the glenoid cavity, or just the glenoid. That's that big indentation on the scapula where the humerus can fit right inside. So the glenoid cavity, or the glenoid, is the indentation on the scapula where the humerus goes in, the glenohumeral joint. That's up here at the shoulder. I didn't ask you to label it, but I'll mention, since we're, we're up in the area, there's also a joint on the front side of your shoulder. The joint on the front side of your shoulder is called the acromioclavicular joint. Let me move that. The acromioclavicular joint. This is between the clavicle, which is your, your collarbone, and a structure called the acromion, which is the part that reaches around from the spine of the scapula, it reaches around and uh, it touches the front side. So the acromioclavicular joint, that's one shoulder joint. The glenohumeral joint, that's the other shoulder joint that we see up here. The humeroradial joint and the humero ulnar joint are my two joints that I see at the elbow. 
when I am talking about the joint that is more medial, so this part right here, the one that's more medial, is that humeral radial or humeral ulnar when I'm medial? Which one is medial? Yeah, the ulnar one is the one that's medial. So humeral ulnar, because remember the ulna is on the pinky side and the pinky side is uh, the side that the ulna is found on. So the, the location where the, the humerus interacts with the ulna or the medial bone, humeral ulnar joint, and then the humero radial joint is where the humerus interacts with the radius. That's on the lateral side. Again, this was a good general review for the locations of these different joints. I would encourage you to either use the skeleton that's, that's in your lab packet or do a quick Google search for a skeleton. Labeling the joints big picture like this so you can see them all over on a skeleton, that's a great way to study where they are. So study pro tip, download yourself a skeleton, go through and label where each of those joints are based on the names of, of the bones. We also reviewed the location of several of our different muscles that we find on the body. Remember that we are predicting muscle actions based on their locations. They're all causing movements at various joints, whether they're found on the front side of the body or the back side of the body, whether they're found on the lateral side of the body or the medial side of the body, all of those things can dictate which way they're making stuff move. So let's go through and we're gonna label our muscles. I'm going to ask you as we work our way down, down the list here, I'm gonna ask you if they are front or backside and then I'm gonna ask you if it is arm, leg, or trunk. We'll, we'll go big picture questions. So let, let's, let's test this out. When we talk about the adductor group, is this something that's more on the front or the back side of the body, the adductor group? Or you could even tell me if it's which image we see it on. Do we see it on the front or the back? Okay. So we're all agreeing we're seeing it on the anterior picture. Yeah, it is a muscle that's kind of more medial. Absolutely. Is the adductor group on the arm, the leg, or the torso? The adductor group. We know we're on the front. Yeah, and it is a leg muscle. So the adductor group, I guess, hmm, what's going to be better, to put the numbers on there or to color code them? What do you all think is going to be most helpful? Because I'll defer to you all. Should we do numbers? Audrey thinks numbers. Okay, we'll do numbers. Adductor group. I know I had one of my groups say green showed up good. Adductor group is a muscle that I find in the medial thigh on the front. That is what happens when you press shift with number one. Dr. Ollis is on a roll, guys. We're doing awesome here. <laughs> All right. Adductor group. Muscle number one that we can see here on Muscle Man. So this is the muscle that you find in the very medial thigh, kind of looks triangle. Adductor group. One of my groups was talking about how its name tells us exactly um, what it does. This is a muscle that does adduction. It pulls the leg toward the middle of the body. We're adding the leg back to the body, the adductor group. All right, let's go to our next muscle here. When we talk about biceps brachii, that is a little weird to say front or back, but can you tell me, is this arm, leg, or torso? Where's biceps brachii? Arm, leg, or torso? Yeah, brachii tells me that we're talking about the arm. Biceps brachii, uh, when we're standing in anatomical position, which remember our, our friend here is not anatomical position. When you're in anatomical position, biceps brachii is on the front. Uh, on muscle man here, we can see biceps brachii in these two locations. 
So I'm going to label number two and number two. Biceps brachii is the one that you curl when you're doing a biceps curl. So this is the one that we find, uh, again, when we're in anatomical position, this is the one that's on the front of the arm. When we're in anatomical position, who's on the back side? Who's opposite of biceps brachii? Who lives right behind? So we can see it really well right here and really well right here. Yeah, exactly. So my friend who's on the opposite side of the arm, this one back here is triceps brachii. So triceps brachii, number 19, that is on the opposite side of, of the arm. Triceps brachii and biceps brachii, remember we called them antagonists, meaning they have opposite functions. So biceps brachii is going to flex the forearm. It's going to bring the forearm closer to the upper arm. Triceps brachii is going to extend the forearm. They live on opposite sides. They do opposite functions. Triceps brachii on the back side biceps brachii on the front. Hey, biceps femoris, arm, leg, or torso? Biceps femoris. Yeah, so with biceps femoris, now we got to hone in on that keyword. Let me pick a different color here. We got to hone in on femoris. Femoris. This means we're on the femur now, we're on the femur. When we talk about biceps femoris, is that one on the front or the back? Biceps femoris, we know we're on the femur. Yeah, so this is one that I find on the back side of the leg. Specifically, biceps femoris is the one that we find laterally, laterally. So that's number three. Biceps femoris on the lateral side of, of the leg. Next door to it is another muscle that we need to know. Who's the one on the back that's, that's next door? That's a little bit more medial. Do we remember the name of this one next door to it? Pick a new color here. Yeah, so that was a mean one for me to make you type. I apologize. That is muscle number 14. So this one here in the middle is called semitendinosus, semitendinosus. So when you're looking at the muscles on the back side of the leg, biceps femoris on the outside, semitendinosus more toward the inside. We don't make you identify it, but I think we might ask you to know the action of a little tiny muscle that lives in here called semimembranosus. So semitendinosus and semimembranosus, these live in the middle. Biceps femoris lives on the outside. But all of these are muscles that live on the back side of the leg, which means that these are going to be muscles that extend the leg at the coxal joint. They're all going to pull the leg backwards. They're also going to help us with doing what we call flexion of, of the tibia. They're going to pull the tibia up toward the leg. All of my friends that live here on the backside, they all do the same thing. Hey, so we've got biceps femoris here on the backside of the leg. We've got another femoris on the front side of the leg. This femoris right here on the front side of the leg, who's this one right here? Do you remember the first name of, of this femoris friend here? Yeah, exactly. This one is called rectus femoris. So rectus femoris. Rectus means parallel to the midline. So parallel to the femur on the front is rectus femoris. Rectus femoris, muscle number 12. Next to it, on the front side of the thigh, we have two really large muscles. One of them is the large muscle in the middle. 
One of them is the large muscle on the outside. What's the first name of these two muscles? They have the same first name. They've just got different last names. Yeah, exactly. These are my vastus muscles. Vastus meaning really large. So when we're talking about the really large muscle that's on the medial part of the thigh, that's vastus medialis in the middle. When we're talking about the really large muscle that's on the lateral aspect of the thigh, that's vastus lateralis, vastus lateralis on the outside. Hey, another muscle on the front that we haven't labeled yet is this one right here. This is actually the longest muscle in the body. Do we remember the name of, of this long funky one right here that kind of crisscrosses across? Yeah, so, so this long crisscross funky one here, this one's called sartorius. So let me get a new color for sartorius. Sartorius, the longest muscle in, in the body. Uh, when you think about sartorius, when you're sitting cross-legged, so crisscross applesauce, my, my kindergarten teacher mom is coming out here. When we sit like that, it stretches out this muscle, helps that, that muscle to stretch, sartorius. That's everybody on the front side. We forgot some friends on the back side. Let's go back to this one right here. I hope we all know this one. We better know this one back here. Who's the really big one in the gluteal region? Probably said too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gluteus maximus, gluteus maximus, number eight. Gluteus maximus, that's the really big one we see back here. Now, next to gluteus maximus, we actually see our other gluteal muscle. Orange really doesn't show up. Let's try again. This one that's kind of covered in connective tissue, this is gluteus medius. Gluteus medius. Medius means it's medium-sized. Maximus means it's really big. So gluteus maximus and gluteus medius, both of them seen up here. You can kind of see, for your reference, a little bit of gluteus medius right here, but it's easiest to see either when we're looking from this picture or if we have a view that's totally a, a side view here. All right, let's go back to our list because we've kind of bounced around uh, a little bit when we're, we're working our way through. We skipped brachioradialis brachioradialis is this a arm leg or torso muscle brachioradialis brachioradialis yeah this is an arm muscle i can tell because when i'm looking at its name i gotta stop picking orange that's a bad plan <laughs> i can tell when i'm looking at its name i can see that brachio part brachio for brachioradialis Brachioradialis is a little bit challenging to locate for sure. Uh, we can see it much better on those ones that are up close, but it's generally kind of in, in this area up here, brachioradialis. It goes from the humerus down to the radius. It, it wraps around them. We should all know the deltoid. Is this a arm, leg, or torso muscle? Where's the deltoid? Yeah, exactly. This is an arm muscle. Deltoid is an arm muscle. Deltoid is the big triangle shaped muscle that I'm coloring here in green, the deltoid. So the deltoid is the one on top of the shoulder. It kind of reaches around to the front and the back. When we're predicting actions of, of the deltoid, the big thing for it is this does abduction where it pulls the arm up like aliens are abducting you. That's the deltoid because it's on the lateral side of the arm. Next door to the deltoid, we have another muscle that's named based on its shape. This big one right here. Who's this one that I'm drawing a, drawing a line around? Well, with my finger here. What's that big one? 
Yeah, exactly. That is trapezius. So trapezius, I'm going to actually draw a line around it here. Trapezius, muscle number 18, that's the big trapezoid-shaped muscle on your back. Hey, just below trapezius is another uh, muscle that uh, is, is relatively large. I'm going to draw around that one. This muscle that I'm drawing down here, who is this down here? That's another color that's not great. Yeah, exactly. That's latissimus. Latissimus dorsi, that's number 10, latissimus dorsi. In between the deltoid and the trapezius and latissimus dorsi, we've got uh, a little muscle that we're labeling. Uh, I want to make sure I don't get it wrong. Um, help me out here because, um, fair warning, it's been a while since I reviewed Terry's. Is this Terry's minor and Terry's major is here? So is this one major and this one's minor? Is that right? It's been a little while. <laughs> okay, so my, my Terry's muscles, Kira doesn't think so. I think I'm mixed up. Yeah, I think you're right. Here, I'm going to ask my friend the Google. Terry's major, to make sure I get, get the location right. Okay, I suspect, so is this one Terry's major? And this is subscapularis? Okay, so, nope, Timmy Teo says I'm right, Kira says I'm wrong. Let me, let me actually pull this all up. I apologize, guys, I'm just being real. It's been a little while. This one right here is a Terry's major, and this tiny one right here is a Terry's minor. So right here, Terry's major, correct? That's what I'm seeing on my picture. Correct. Terry's major, and then, and then we've got infraspinatus, yeah. Terry's minor, minor, right here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for, for helping me out with that. So Terry's major is this one. Terry's minor, I don't think we actually ask you to label ever, so this little tiny one. So big one, Terry's major. This one right here is called infraspinatus. I can't remember if we made you learn infraspinatus. Did we make you learn that one? Yes, okay. So infraspinatus gets its name because it's below the spine of the scapula. So this big one, I didn't make you label it on here, but the big one, infraspinatus, below the spine of the scapula. Terry's major, this smaller one that reaches around, then the little tiny one, Terry's minor. So let's get some colors out here. I'm going to do, we'll do black because I haven't used that yet. There's my little Terry's minor, or Terry's major, excuse me. I just need to stop talking. <laughs> Terry's major, number 16 right there. And I didn't make you label it, but I'll, I'll put a little line since we talked about it. This one in the gray is called infraspinatus. Infraspinatus. Do you have to know it for the exam? Don't have to know it for, for this activity. <laughs> yeah, I, let, let's have a moment of, of realness here, guys. This is what happens if you don't adequately prepare for the exam. You will be like Dr. Aulis on the exam, except when you take the exam, you can't consult your friend the Google. So yeah, do your rehearsal, right? Because it has been um, it, it's been five months since I last for sure reviewed the location of Terry's major. And it was not something committed to my long-term memory. So that came back to bite me. Don't be let don't don't follow my example. That was a bad example. <laughs> All right, let's go down here. We got a big friend here on the back of the leg that we have not labeled yet. Who's this big one that we show off in heels? Who's this friend down here? Yep, this one is gastrocnemius. I did know that one. For the record, <laughs> gastrocnemius, that's this one down here on the back side of the shin, gastrocnemius number six. Uh, I guess I only made you know, we'll go back to the front side. Uh, I made you know my muscle right here on the front side. Who's this one on the front of the tibia? 
Its name tells me everything I need to know. The front of the tibia. Yeah, exactly. Anterior means front. Tibialis means tibia. So the one on the front of the tibia, tibialis anterior. We didn't label it on our activity today, but we did label it in, um, in the lab packet when we were learning muscles. Right in front of gastrocnemius, so kind of wedged between gastrocnemius and uh, the tibia is a little muscle called soleus. You can also see soleus over here, soleus, a muscle that, that we find just in front of gastrocnemius. Fibularis longus, another one I didn't make you, make you know. That's the one that's on the very outside, fibularis longus. I didn't make us label that one because I don't think we made you predict its action. All right, let's see. We have, yeah, the other one too, yep, that Timmy Tao mentioned. We've also got, let me pick a color. We've also got extensor digitorum. This, uh, is that the right place for that? That might not be the right place for that. Okay, it is. Perfect. Uh, so right next door to, to tibialis is extensor digitorum. Um, that's probably my best view, although if I looked head on, you'd see it a little bit better too. We have not labeled our friend, let me pick a color, this color right here. We've not labeled our purple friend that I just colored in right there along the very medial surface of the thigh. What's the name of the long skinny one? Along the medial surface, yep, that is gracilis. So number nine along the medial thigh, gracilis. We should all know this one. Where do I find pectoralis major? Y'all better know this one. Where are those pecs? Pectoralis major. Exactly, that's the chest. So the big muscles here in the chest, they actually go out and insert on the arm. That's pectoralis, pectoralis major. There is also a pectoralis minor, but it's hiding underneath major. We, we never actually see it. Uh, pectoralis is actually anterior. Oh, you're joking with me, Kaylin. I see your LOL. I was like, uh, I hope we know that the pecs are on the front. <laughs> All right. Only one left is sterno, clido, mastoid. The one with like the worst name in the world, right? But sterno, clido, mastoid tells us exactly where it attaches. The sternum, the clavicle, and the mastoid process, which is a bone marking that hangs down from the temporal bone. Sternoclidomastoid, this, this muscle that I see right here. So last one to label, I'll go ahead and circle it in black. Sternoclidomastoid, that's number 15. All right, so we labeled all of the muscles on our list. Again, I believe where I got this list from was actually all the muscles that we made you predict actions on. I think that's how I made this list. But remember that any of the muscles that you learned uh, from lesson number seven on, they're all fair game. But these are all the ones that we need to know their location for the sake of predicting actions. How do we feel about muscle locations? Thumbs up, thumbs down, crying emoji. <laughs> Kaylin has all the emotions. I've officially driven Krissa crazy. You gotta hang on a little bit longer, Krissa. You can't go crazy on me yet. We're, we're not done yet. <laughs> all right, so here is uh, my recommendation again. Remember how we were joking about long-term memory and rehearsal and stuff? Honestly, I really think if you have the ability to print the picture of the muscle man like 20 times, going through and labeling the muscles a lot of times is going to be the most helpful for you. Or actually, something that I've seen uh, some other A&P students 
if you go to Walmart and get those sheet protectors that you can like slide paper in and out of, get one of those, print a, a, a copy of Muscle Man, and then get those vis-a-vis -vis markers, yeah, the washable markers, label everything, erase it all, and do it again. Then you don't have to print Muscle Man 20 times. You can label him 20 times on one piece of paper. So consider getting those, wa those sheet protectors and some of those wash off markers. That would be a great way to practice reviewing these muscle locations. Yeah, save the trees, give yourself plenty of practice, and then you can figure out too which particular muscles are, are giving you trouble. Maybe you're totally good on pectoralis major. I hope we're, we're really good on pectoralis major. Maybe you're like Dr. Aulis and you gotta work on teres. So just label teres 20 times in a row or label the ones that, that we're struggling with a little bit. Um, do that over and over. The more you practice, the, the better you can, can do. Oh, I like it. Yeah. So, so Tien gave the idea too, that you could tape it to a window. Absolutely. Yeah. So tape it to the outside of the window, pull up a washable marker and you could do it that way too. That's perfect. I love it. Yeah. We got to know these muscles for the exam. So this is not everything on the exam. <laughs> this is one part of the exam, knowing the locations, knowing the actions, uh, knowing the joints, the bone markings, um, all of the ones from the packet are fair game. So these are some of the big ones. Hopefully most of these you're good on. And then we just keep reviewing the ones that, that are tripping us up. All right, let's talk actions. Today, my goal for you is to really help us pound in uh, the idea of using the location of a muscle to figure out what it does. So what I've done is I've gone through the lab packets and I've taken the rules that talk about the ways that we move the hip joint or the knee joint or the elbow, the wrist, the shoulder. I've taken those rules and I've kind of split them up one at a time. We're going to go through and draw some fake muscles. We're going to talk about the way that these rules work. So I would recommend maybe grabbing a blank piece of paper or if you wanna pull out your lab packets as we work our way through, you can take notes on those pages where, where we have the rules. Uh, but we're gonna go through and just talk about all the movement rules. And hopefully by the end of this, we feel a little bit more confident about, about muscle actions. So we're gonna start with moving things at the coxal joint, at the coxal joint. Um, yeah, so friends who have a lab packet, um, I believe, or which packet talks about the bones and muscles of the leg? Was that number eight, number nine? I can't remember which packet we, okay, packet number eight. Um, so whatever page the rules start on in packet number eight. Do we know what page it is? About page 12 to 14, somewhere in that ballpark. 11, <laughs> somewhere toward the end of the packet where it starts talking about movements of the lower limb. That's, that's where you're gonna find these rules. The first set of movements for us to know when we're talking, talking about moving the lower limb is the ways you can move your coxal joint, the ways you can move your hip joint. What, the first movement that our hip joint does for us is we can do flexion and we can do extension. Now, when we talk, actually here, let's color code here. When we talk about flexion of the hip joint, flexion of the hip joint is when you raise your thigh. So we're sitting in a chair or we're laying in bed. You can raise your thigh when we bring the femur closer to the pelvis and closer to the rib cage. That is flexion, bringing this closer to, to the other bones. When we talk about extension, this is pulling the femur away from the front of the body. So it's going from you're sitting up and, and your legs are, are close to your pelvis, we're extending them backwards, like when you push down and you're walking. Extension, pulling the, the femur backwards, 
this movement is done by muscles that live on the back side of the skeleton. So this is some of those muscles we talked about before. Uh, remember how we had biceps femoris that lived on kind of the lateral backside? We talked about how we had semitendinosis that was a little bit more on the medial side. When we talked about gluteus maximus that lived on the backside, these are muscles that live on the backside of the body. Let's add gluteus here. So gluteus is like this on the body. Here's where we get to tie in our, our movement words. Every muscle has an origin and an insertion. The insertion is the part that moves when a muscle contracts. If you live on the back side of the body, your insertion, which is always gonna be the distal point, if I live on the back and I'm moving this part toward this part, that's always gonna pull me backwards. I'm always gonna do extension when I pull this attachment point backwards. So moving the femur backwards, that is extension. If you live on the back side of the femur, you pull or you do extension by pulling the femur backwards. If you live on the front side of, of the femur, so this is, we're talking about muscles like rectus femoris, for example, or we're talking about vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. If you live on the front side of the femur, when you contract, you're gonna pull that femur closer to the pelvis. So let's draw rectus here. Here's rectus. Remember my insertion, the part that moves, is always gonna be distal, and the part that doesn't move is proximal. When I move my insertion, my moving point, toward my origin, the non-moving point, that's gonna pull the femur up to bring these things closer together. If you live on the front side and I contract you and I pull on you, I'm going to pull you forward. Hey, I was thinking about this before we had class today. Rem just remember this, instead of using anterior in your rule name, let's change it to front. We're gonna say things on the front of the thigh flex. If you're on the front, you flex the thigh. So front muscles flex the femur, back muscles extend the femur. They pull it backwards. We also talk about muscles that are found on the medial side of the thigh. So there's one that we didn't label on our other pictures. We've got one that's called tensor fascia latte. Sounds like a Starbucks drink. That lives on the outside of the thigh. My muscles that live on the outside of the thigh, they also do flexion. Yeah, so Carissa asked a clarifying question. Is the insertion always distal? Yes, the insertion, the moving part is always distal. So uh, when I move my, my part and actually tensor fascia latte actually connects all the way up here at the top. When I move this moving part toward here, it's also going to pull it forward. We're also going to do flexion. So first rule for you to remember when we're thinking about the thigh, if you live on the front of the thigh or the side of the thigh, you're doing flexion. If you live on the back side of the thigh, you're doing extension. So you can apply this rule if you go back to, to muscle man. Uh, if we go back to muscle man and uh, you're looking at all the leg muscles and we see biceps and we see semi tendinosis, these muscles are going to do extension. The muscles on the other side are going to do flexion. Uh, Kira asked in the chat if we're going to use the word flex or if we're going to use uh, 
the description of what flexing means, which is making it smaller. I believe on the exam we will use the term flexion. Uh, so I believe we'll use flexion and extension. Make sure you review what those terms mean, because I'm pretty sure there's at least one or two questions that will ask you um, about what those words mean. So it would be good for us to know. But I'm pretty sure when you have questions like this, uh, it's going to use the term flexion or extension. Uh, Fanchon asked about the, the insertions rule, so the insertion being distal, if that just applied to the leg. Uh, no, that also applies to the arms as well. So the insertion point is always going to be distal when we're talking about uh, arms or, or legs. Yeah, it's, it's both of those limbs. All right, flexion and extension. The first thing that we can do with our femur, either pull it forward if you live on the front or backwards if you live on the back. Flexion on the front, extension on the back. Let's look at our next set of rules. Well, actually, sorry, here's another picture. It shows you the same thing. I just got a different skeleton because I thought it might help us. Flexion is when I pull the leg forward. Extension is when it comes backwards. Sometimes it's hard to, to see what those things look like. So imagine a skeleton that's walking. Flexion is when you take that femur from a farther back position and pull it forward. Extension is when we take it back this direction. So. We're, we're still doing flex and extend here. Let's transition to our next set of words. Our next set of words are abduct and adduct. Abduct and adduct. When we talk about abduction, think about what would happen to you if the aliens were abducting you. So when aliens come to abduct you, they're pulling you up and away. Abduction of, of your thigh looks like the thigh going away. Later, we're going to talk about abduction of the arm. It's when things move away from the midline. Adduction is when we add the limb back down. So adduction of the arm would be like that. Adduction of the thigh, moving it toward the midline. Check this out. If you live on the outside of the thigh, so if I'm a muscle out here, when I contract, here's my moving part. That was my, my insertion, which is distal to my origin. When I move this part closer to this part, the whole femur is going to pull up. If you live on the lateral side of the thigh, if you're on the outside of the thigh, you're going to pull the femur away. You're going to do abduction. If you live on the inside, and our, our favorite example of, of the inside muscles are those adductors. We love them because their name tells us this, but imagine if you're thinking about the adductors. When I move this attachment site closer to the middle in here, that's going to pull the femur back down. If you live on the medial side of the thigh and we bring it closer to the midline, we make this muscle shorter, that's going to pull the thigh in. If you live on the outside of the thigh and I make you shorter, that's going to pull the whole femur, the whole thigh out. Muscles on the outside or the lateral side of the thigh do abduction. They pull the, the body part out. Muscles on the medial side, they're going to pull that part in. They're doing adduction. Hey, while we're at it, since, since I drew up here for you our arms as well, let's add that muscle we talked about before, the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle has its insertion, its moving point down there on the shoulder and its origin up here. See how if I pull this closer to here, if we're making this muscle shorter, my arm is going to come up. The aliens are abducting me. When we talk about a muscle that, that's more medial, that helps with adduction, 
we could add our friend pectoralis here. So here's pectoralis. Pectoralis has an insertion out here and an origin right here. When I make this muscle shorter, it's going to pull my arm back down. So if you live on the middle part of the body and you attach to the arm, you're pulling that arm in toward the middle. If you live on the outside of the body, the lateral side of the body, you're going to pull that body part up and away. Abduction, if you live on the outside, you're pulling that part out. Adduction, if you live in the middle, you're pulling that part toward the middle. How do we feel right now about abduction and adduction, flexion and extension? I would really encourage you to, especially if, if we're not feeling awesome about this, remember how, how I told you when we started doing movements, you've got your body and you can move your body and it's going to be just fine. I promise. I would encourage you to touch your, your deltoid where it attaches at the bottom. So touch about halfway down your humerus. That's where the insertion for the deltoid is. The origin for it, if you touch the top of your shoulder, that's the origin. So I need to move that part halfway down my humerus. I need to get that closer to the top of my shoulder. The way I do that is by lifting up my arm, by doing abduction. So when we're thinking about muscles on your thigh, if you feel halfway down your thigh um, and we're on the front, or well, let's go to the side because we're talking about adduction here. Abduction, adduction. If you feel halfway down your thigh and you put your other hand on your hip, since we're, we're not using our shoulder joint, if I want to bring that, that hand that's in the middle of my thigh up to my hip, the way I'm going to do that is by pulling my, my femur away from the midline of my body. I'm doing abduction. I'm spreading it out. And if we, we touch the middle of our chest and we touch the top of our shoulder, if I'm bringing the shoulder together, or if I, if I wanna bring my shoulder closer to my sternum, that's adduction, I'm pulling it back in. Or if we think about a point halfway down the middle of our thigh, bringing it toward the midline. So yeah, like, like we're joking, but in all seriousness, it's true. You have your body, you can act out these movements I promise you, nobody's watching. I'm not gonna go back and watch your video and watch your interpretive dance. I'm not gonna do that. But if it helps you remember, please, by all means, do it. Yeah, like, like Audrey mentioned, even King Julian, the, um, the lemur is telling us, you gotta move it. We need to move our body to make these predictions. Abduction, if you live on the lateral side of the body, you're going to pull stuff out. You're going to abduct. Adduction, if you live in the middle, you're going to pull things in. You're going to do adduction, pull it back toward the middle of the body. What we were just talking about, by the way, let me underline something for you because we need to make sure you remember this. Notice how these movements we just talked about how we've specified the name of the bone and we've specified the joint. Remember how I told you way back when we first started doing the origin and insertion activities, how I told you that I'm going to ask you to predict a movement based on a picture. So it's going to be a totally bogus muscle. You've never seen it before. It may not even exist. I'm going to give you the origin of the muscle. I'm going to give you the insertion of the muscle. And then I'll connect the dots because, you know, I like to color. I'm going to give you this, a picture just like this. And I'm going to say, 
what action would this muscle do? Again, this is when you have a body, use your body. We put one down, hand down most of the way down our thigh. We put the other hand on our hip. The hand on our hip is the origin, no movement. The hand on our thigh is the insertion. When I bring those things together, I end up pulling my femur forward. First part of your answer is you'd be telling me that the femur is moving, not that the pelvis is moving because the pelvis doesn't move. The femur is moving and the movement that we're doing is called flexion because I'm bringing the femur closer to the pelvis. So you'll see a picture like this, for example, and I'll ask you to tell me which of these places is moving. It's always the insertion. And I promise I'll tell you which one's the origin and which one's the insertion. You would tell me that the femur is moving and it's, it's moving closer to the hip or we're doing flexion because it's coming closer together. We'll do some more practice with that so that we, we get better at making those kinds of predictions. Our next rule, I wanna point out, look, before we were talking about the femur at the coxal joint. We're shifting gears now. Now we're talking about moving the tibia at the tibiofemoral joint. The tibia at the tibiofemoral joint. For these rules, it's really, again, gonna help you to act these things out. When I extend my, I am making the tibia go farther away from the femur. That's what extension is. When I pull two things away from each other. So when I extend the tibia, this is when you're kicking a ball. Extending the tibia is you kick a ball. It goes forward. When I talk about flexing the tibia, I'm bringing the tibia closer to the femur. This is when you, you pull your leg back to get ready to kick. So preparing to kick is flexion. Kicking is extension. The first thing that we need to learn about how the tibia moves, you've got to memorize those words. Extension of the tibia, so of your leg down here, extension is actually going forward. When we were talking about what happened at the coxal joint, at the hip joint, we called that flexion. So watch our terminology. When we're pulling our tibia backwards, when we're getting it closer to the femur, that is flexion. If you can keep in mind the fact that these words are opposite from what we just said with, with moving the femur, it should be really easy for us to make, make predictions. So when I'm moving forward, if you know that moving forward for the tibia means you're extending, my muscles that live on the front side up here, they're going to do, they're going to do that forward movement. So here, let's go back to our friend biceps, or excuse me, uh, rectus femoris. Here's our friend rectus femoris. Rectus femoris, here's my insertion. And my origin is way up high. When I move this toward here, you're kicking your leg. So I live on the front side. I'm moving the tibia toward the front. When the tibia moves toward the front, that's called extension because the distance between these bones just got bigger. If you live on the front of the thigh and you're pulling on the tibia, you're pulling the tibia forward. And the name of pulling the tibia forward is extension. So vastus, lateralis, and medialis, rectus, femoris, 
all of those muscles on the anterior part of the thigh, when they pull on the tibia, they extend it. They make it come forward. If you live on the back side of the femur, so for example, biceps femoris, that was back here, biceps femoris. <coughs> Excuse me. When I move my insertion, my moving part toward my origin, which is, is up here, my non-moving part, this pulls the tibia backwards. My muscle that lives on the backside pulls the tibia backwards. But because moving the tibia backwards brings these bones closer together, I call that flexion. I need to pause for a moment because I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm blowing your mind. I need you to ask me questions that you have in the chat or tell me what you're thinking about these rules. Okay, well, here's what I would recommend. Make sure you can visualize what this looks like. So if I live on the back, I'm pulling the tibia toward the back. That's step one, making sure we know that if you live on the backside, you're pulling the tibia toward the back. Just like if you live on the backside, you pull the femur toward the back. What's different is the fact that if the tibia moves backwards, it gets closer to the femur. Whereas if my femur is moving backwards, it's getting farther from my hip bones. So if you live on the back, you always move stuff backwards. When we're talking about moving the femur, we call that backwards movement extension. When we're talking about moving the tibia backwards, we call that flexion. If you live on the front side, you always pull stuff forward. If you pull the femur forward, we call that flexion. If you pull the tibia for that forward, we call that extension. So remind yourself what extension and flexion mean. If you know generally which way things are moving, I promise you on the exam, I want you to sit there and do the actions. And if you can see when your knees bent and you pull your tibia forward, if you can see how your knee joint gets bigger when you pull the tibia forward, that's literally what extension means. The space between them gets bigger. So if I act out my tibia moving forward, which is why friends on the front do. If I can see that I made this bigger, that's extension. If I act out my tibia going backwards, I can see that my joint gets smaller. That's literally what flexion means. So please, please act these things out. I think that's going to help you with, with this terminology. Yeah, so so take your time with it when you're doing it. I see some comments in the chat about about needing needing to take time with it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so Tian actually asked an excellent question um, that I want to hone in on. Tian asked, just because something extends the femur, that doesn't mean it extends the tibia. That is correct. And if you want to memorize Here's, here's the memorize I want you to do. I want you to memorize that when we talk about moving the femur, if you live on the front, you do flexion. 
And when we talk about moving the tibia, if you live on the front, you do extension. It's, it's opposite. So if you are talking about moving the femur and you live on the back side, you're going to extend the femur. If you're talking about moving the tibia and you live on the back side, you're going to flex. It's opposite. So if we memorize that these are opposite from each other, we're always moving the same direction. This always pulls stuff back, but because of the way the knee joint works, how it's opposite from the way that the hip joint works, it messes with our terminology. But we're always pulling stuff backwards if you live on the back. Just like we're always pulling stuff forward if you live on the front, it's just, again, the knee joint is backwards compared to the hip joint. So we use different words for it. Yeah, so when you're, when you're working on the exam, if these questions you know are going to take you a lot of extra time, skip the question, come back to it later. I promise you when you're taking the exam, there's going to be plenty of questions that you know the answer to right away. Go get those easy points and then come back at the end to work on questions that are giving you a little bit more trouble. Practicing, making these kinds of predictions, answering these kinds of questions on the, the review assignments, I know there's a million and one, but they're designed to get you thinking like this and thinking like this faster so it doesn't take us five minutes, right? I believe we have 75 minutes for the exam. There are 60 questions on the exam. So you do have more than a minute per question, but go through and knock out those easy questions first so you can come back to the ones that give you a little bit more trouble at the end. Here's the good news. The knee joint is the bane of our existence. It, it makes things backwards, right? The good news is everything in the arm is all the same. So if you live on the front of, of the arm, you always do flexion. It's always called flexion. Whether we're talking about pulling the humerus, that's flexing the humerus forward. Whether we're talking about the radius and the ulna, we're flexing the radius and the ulna. If we're talking about the wrist joint, we're flexing the fingers. Everybody on the front flexes in the arm. It's just this stupid knee joint that's backwards. And I know we've, we've chatted in, in the chat, right, how several of us have messed up our knees. So we can agree on so many levels that the knee joint is just stupid, right? <laughs> It, we, we have to use different words for the movements that it does and it falls apart and we can't fix it. That stupid knee joint down there making stuff move. <laughs> Pretty sure Audrey that not all 60 question have three parts for the record. That would just be mean. <laughs> I know we're mean. I don't think we're that mean. <laughs> One other leg mo movement that I want to mention here really fast dorsiflexion oops and i forgot to change my word here this should be plantar flexion plantar flexion when we're talking about moving the ankle joint instead of calling things just plain flexion and extension we call these dorsiflexion and plantar flexion if you are a muscle that lives on the front side of the foot, so we're talking tibialis anterior, when you pull on the foot, here's where I attach down here, and here is my other attachment site. When I make this attachment site come closer up here, my whole foot is doing what's called dorsiflexion. My foot bends up. We bend the foot toward the back side of the body, dorsiflexion. If you live on the front side, you are pulling the foot up toward the back side of the body. If you live on the back side, like our friend gastrocnemius back there, 
if you live on the back side and you pull on the foot, when you pull on the foot, it's going to pull the foot down because the foot is going toward the back side of the body that this direction. So it's going toward the ground. Plantar flexion is what we do when we're in heels, plant our feet into the ground. If you live on the back side of the leg, you plantar flex things, you put them into the ground. If you live on the front side of the leg, you pull that foot up dorsiflexion. Hip joint rules we need to know. If you live on the front, you do flexion. If you live on the back, you do extension. We need to know abduction and adduction at the hip joint. If you live in the middle, you abduct or adduct. You pull things in if you live in the middle. If you live on the outside, you abduct. You pull them away. And then this stupid knee joint, right? If you live on the front side, you pull the tibia to the front, which is called extension. If you live on the back side, you pull the tibia toward the back. I call that flexion when I pull it backwards. Then we go down to the ankle. When we talk about the ankle, if you live on the front, you dorsiflex, you pull that foot up. If you live on the back, you plantar flex, you pull that foot down. Like I mentioned, the arm is so much kinder. Anybody on the front, flexion. We're all, we always call it flexion. Anybody on the back, we call it extension. The other thing we have to add for the arm, let me find that, that rule. The other thing we have to add for the arm is abduction and adduction. So let's talk about these. Abduction. Just like when, when we were talking about it with the leg, abduction at the wrist joint, we're going away from the middle of the body. So if I'm a muscle, for example, flexor carpi radialis, if I live out here on the radius side, the thumb side, and I contract, I'm here on the lateral side, I pull my hand laterally, that movement is called abduction. If I live on the medial side of the hand, so let's draw our friend flexor carpi ulnaris that lives on the ulna side. When I contract, I'm gonna move my, my insertion toward the middle. It's coming toward the attachment side up here but it's pulling the hand to the middle. That's what adduction is, when the hand moves toward the middle. Just like our rules that we saw with the leg, if you live on the medial side, you do adduction. If you live on the lateral side, you do abduction. That's true at the wrist joint. That's true at the shoulder joint. That's true at the hip joint. Medial and lateral always tells you if we're adducting or abducting, always. Most of the time, let me see if I can go back to a skeleton like this. Most of the time, if you live on the front, you do flexion. If you live on the back, you do extension, except for the curse you knee joint. We don't love you anymore because you're no fun. We are just about out of time. I know there is so much to process. Do we have any pressing questions that I could answer right now that, that we can put to words right now? On a scale of one to 10, 
how much do we feel like we know about muscle actions right now or our ability to predict? How confident are we in our ability to make some of these predictions about muscle movements? One, I could make no predictions. 10, I think I could predict them all. Where do we think we're at? Okay. Hey, I'm happy to see that nobody gave me a one. Nobody feels like they can't predict anything. It is totally fine to be at a five because OMG, I just blew your mind today, right? This is a lot to process and a lot to think through. If you are a visual learner, print out some skeletons and do some drawings like we did. So you know how we kept adding all those arrows, right? So we can add an arrow right here and then we can put next to it the name of that movement or add an arrow back here. We can add arrows all over the place. Visualizing what these rules mean, I think will help you if you're a visual learner. So get yourself a skeleton, use your own body, act out these movements. The more senses we can get involved, the more likely we are to remember. Oh no, Audrey, I'm so sorry. Definitely not, not a good time to have a hurting brain, right? Figuratively and, and literally. Hey, so one last thing I wanna mention for you. I, I told you this and we, we did this a little bit before. On the exam, I'm gonna draw you some bogus muscles and I'm going to ask you to tell me what those muscles do. So check this out. I am, am drawing for you some made up muscles. They're going to be like real muscles in the body because, you know, there's only so much I can make up, right? Say I give you a skeleton on the exam. And this is, this is the... the muscle that I drew on the skeleton for you. And I tell you that this is the origin and this is the insertion. Before you put anything in the chat for me, I want each of you to feel about a third of the way through your forearm. And I want you to feel about halfway up your humerus. And I want you to move this insertion, that point that's on, on your radius here, I want you to move it closer to your humerus. So I want you to act that out literally right now. No one's watching, not even Dr. Aulis. I can't see you. When you move this insertion, this moving point toward the origin, can we guess what we call this movement word when this insertion comes toward this origin. Yeah, perfect. This is flexion because I brought these things closer together, right? This is flexion. And Kira mentioned, and this is important, Kira mentioned that we are flexing the radius. We're flexing the radius. Because you know what I promised would be a distractor answer on the exam? That we're flexing the humerus. Why is flexing the humerus wrong? Why is that answer wrong? Exactly. Yep. The origin does not move. Never tell me that, that my part that's labeled in blue, never tell me my origin is the part that moves. So don't tell me we flexed our, our humerus toward our radius. Nope. The humerus didn't move. The radius moved toward the humerus. And because that, that made the angle between them smaller, I would call that flexion. So I flexed the radius. That would be my answer on this one. Or here's another one. My insertion is on the front of your thigh, down by your knee. My origin is up here on your hip bone. When you move the insertion toward the origin, what do we call this movement that we're seeing right here when we move the insertion toward the origin? Uh, 
I got votes. Yeah, I got votes both ways. Looks like we're leaning flexion. Yep. When my, when my femur comes closer to my pelvis, that's flexion. Hey, if I was on the backside, we can go to a backside one. If I gave you the same exact thing, so we're in roughly the same place back here. If I gave you the same thing, since we're on the back side of the body now, now we would call that extension. Now we would call it extension. And hey, I promise you, I, I, I promise I'm not going to watch your proctorio video. Because yeah, Laura mentioned in the chat that she had to do it first. She had to act it out first. 100%, I would have to act it out too. I look at this and I don't know what it is. I need to act it out. So so do it. Act it out. Yeah, so when we're, we're looking at this, this muscle, since I, I put my insertion on the femur, for now, we're just talking about moving the femur, but more likely, like Audrey mentioned, this would actually be a muscle that did go all the way down to the tibia. Absolutely. And if we're going all the way down to the tibia, this is where the knee joint is evil, right? So if we're doing this muscle over here, let's do some typing here. First thing this muscle would do is this muscle would extend the femur at the coxal joint extend the femur at the coxal joint, or it would flex the tibia at the tibiofemoral joint. There's two actions that this muscle could do, and, and two actions it, it would do. It would move the femur, and it would also move the tibia. So check your answer choices, because I suspect for a muscle like this, we might give you an answer choice that says extend the femur, flex the tibia, or we might also give you a choice that says extend the femur and extend the tibia. Well, remember, the knee joint's stupid. They're not the same, right? Or we give you the two that are backwards. So take your time with these questions. Act it out with your own body. Visualize what it would look like to help you predict what, what your answers would be. Uh, I see that Kira has a question, had mentioned for one of the things we were working on, whether abduction and adduction could be an option. Um, yes, it could be an option. If that was the case, though, I wouldn't also give you flexion and extension. If I'm trying to get you to tell me if it abducts or adducts, that's what I'm, I'm going to ask you for. If I'm trying to get you to tell me if it flexes or extends, that's what I'm, I'm going to ask you for. So I'm not going to give you more than one of those functions and count you off because, oh, you weren't thinking like me. And today I wanted abduction and tomorrow I want flexion. No, I will give you one or the other. Yeah. Um, yeah, Chris is asking if she moves too much, will she get kicked out? I do not have my settings set to kick you out for movement. My settings will kick you out if you try to open up another window. Uh, or if you get a notification on your computer, that's an automatic shutdown. It should not kick you out if you're dancing. You should be okay. <laughs> if anything, it might flag it for me and say, hey, you might want to watch this one. And uh, I will will see that you're just doing the anatomy thing and you'll be all good. <laughs> all right. Well, we are about out of time. I am going to go ahead and end the recording, unless we have any last minute questions for that. Tomorrow, we're going to start lecture lesson number 13. So if you have a chance, try to start looking at that stuff. If not, it's not a big deal. Um, but that's that's the plan for tomorrow. Uh, good luck with with this review. And we will start special senses in lecture tomorrow. <laughs>